Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. Um, this one's really interesting. We have uh, Rob Hirschfeld from uh, Rackin with us. Uh, good evening, Rob. Good evening, Stephen. And uh, I guess I'll tell everyone we are recording this evening, and we have a really interesting cast. We have uh, Will Dennis with us from a um, quite an interesting research lab. And Will, hello. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Great. Well, Will, thanks for joining us. And tonight's focus, we're really going to talk about um, open source and the digital rebar project. And one of the great things uh, about Will that I find really interesting is, uh, you know, Will was involved in watching the project Digital Rebar back when it was Crowbar. So he has a bit of a, a long history with this project, which makes him really valuable to kind of pick his brain to see what he thought as the project grew along. So, Will, if you don't mind. Just, although, although people you, might be questioning his sanity as they his listen. Sanity right. for it being along this. Well, I, I can't help you on that part, Will, but if you could, can you just kind of. No one can. No one can help you. Can you just kind of give us your thoughts on, you know, what drew you originally to the Crowbar project? Um, what were you kind of working on and stuff? And then we'll just kind of let the conversation flow from there. All right, great. Um, so I had uh, doings with a conference on the East Coast here. Um, there's this thing called the League of Professional System Administrators, and they ran this little mini conf um, that was called PIC, and then it was called Lopsa East. And anyways, uh, I was... Uh, doing some stuff with OpenStack in my job, and this fella, um, I can't even remember which year, um, that Rob knows, uh, Judd, I'm not going to get his last name right, so what's Judd's last name? Was it Judd Malton, I think? Malton. That was the it, guy from Dell, I remember Judd. Judd. Sure, yeah. okay. All right. So anyways, Judd came by and did this talk about this uh, piece of software called Crowbar that uh, it was uh, quite the gift-tastic talk he gave, but it, it like really piqued my interest because, you know, uh, putting all this stuff together was quite a bit of work. And he had this tool that kind of like, uh, you know, inventoried all the hardware and could upgrade the BIOS and uh, you know, uh, orchestrate all the, you know, get the operating systems installed and orchestrate all the pieces and it looked super awesome. So, you know, I, I ran back after the conference and went to check it out and I, uh, <clears throat> let's say it was, you know, a little rough around the edges and I couldn't quite make heads or tails out of it when I went to use it. It looked awesome when, you know, he understood it. But when I went to use it, I couldn't make it do anything. A lot so of magic. Was, There's a lot of magic yeah. in that tool. Yes. Right. And and so uh, it was it, and it was my first exposure to what I like to call the secret language. You know, um, there was a lot of, and some of it's just because I think it was built around Chef, right, Rob? That's right. Yeah. And and I wasn't a Chef guy, so there's you know all the Chef language in there. But there, there was there was like bar clamps and uh, <laughs> I yeah. forget all the words now. But but anyways, it was it jigs. was quite confusing. Jigs, yes, right. All these <laughs> constructo terms, and uh, I w it was just confusing, right? So I I had to let it go, you know, and go back to my old ways. And so I don't know. I just kept on looking at it because you know I. I've been using cobbler for years and um, we do some other things, you know, some custom PXC and uh, some image based things with clonezilla. And, you know, we have a lot of servers to install and configure and we're always looking for a better way. So I, I kind of latched on to cobbler, but I kept on looking at that crowbar thing. Cause it seemed like it could glue a lot of things together. You know, it could like have a hardware inventory, it could get the operating system on it. It can configure the operating system. Uh, then I started using config management. Uh, I latched on to Ansible. And, you know, I'm looking for this tool that can install the operating system and then go ahead and run the, uh, the orchestration afterwards. You know, that's my holy grail. It's like one tool to do it all. So I, I like push the button, you know, I point at the machine, push the button and walk away and come back and the machine's like ready to deploy you know it's ready for use yep. 
and uh, that's that's not even like self serve. That's me doing it, you know, and me cranking out machines. So you know, I just kept my eyes on it, and it's like, no, it's not ready. I guess I guess V two <laughs> now, yeah, and it looked a lot better, you know, for one thing. Um, I, there was a lot more uh, publicity around it, I guess I would say. And, uh, you know, I, I jumped back in and I had the same sort of experience, unfortunately. I couldn't mm -hmm. kind of make it, like Rob did these beautiful videos and it looked so easy. <laughs> and I tried to do it and I got immediately lost, you know? Yeah. Rob's and, videos are fantastic. Oh. Yeah. He's, he's the master. So, but I don't know, Rob, you don't cooking, skip cooking, steps, the, the, do you? The cooking, the cooking show. <laughs> uh, right, exactly. No, I, I, no I, and I don't cut, I'm not cutting corners. I'm doing, the, I'm baking the whole cake right there. Um, but I, we, we, we hear, Will, you, your experience, we hear. Um, and it's, it's, it's a component of how heterogeneous infrastructure is. Right, you know, you can, you, you show up and you know people have a variation in their infrastructure that we can accommodate but if you don't know how to accommodate it finding the right switch is really hard right it's not it's not unique to what we're building it's it's a problem of building good data center automation it's right you know, simple stuff is simple and then the the complexity curve goes asymptotic um, really quickly is, is the challenge if, if you want to do it repeatedly or multi-site. Right. Right. This was this was our experience, like with with Crowbar, was for Dell servers in the reference architecture, right? Like what Judd what Judd was demoing, you could turn it, go in, turn it on, the crank, and go. But the customers' networks would trip us up, or a, you know, a, a routing requirement, or the switch misconfiguration. It, it, you know, and the whole, the the tower would fall down. Right. And we would have to figure out what knobs to turn and, and put the tower back up. And the only defense we had was actually just to make it much faster to put the tower back together. That was a lot of what, what, we, what we did, what we, all, what we still do, is we're like, look, we, we're not going to protect you from um, the, the house of cards that is data center operations. <laughs> what, right. what we can do is say, now it, you, you don't need, it, you don't need the, the tweezers, the glue, right? You don't have to turn off all the fans anymore when you build that, that house, because if it blows down, you can push a button and it comes back up, right? We, we glued the cards together, so to speak. Right. And I, I like the, I like the thing in Crowbar where it's like, it, it tried, tried, tried again, right? Like if things weren't in the state they were supposed to be, it would just like, you know, keep trying. And, you know, eventually I guess you, you, you could bail out and fix something, but it, 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 it wasn't like, uh, I, I, I just love that feature of it where it worked on many things at the same time and it just, it had to, knew what the dependencies were, but in it kept cycling around. And that was, I thought that was a great feature of that tool. So you, what you're hitting on is actually one of the things that, that I and, and the team sort of loved and also understood had to go for version three. Um, because what, what we so I'll I'll step back because this is this is actually super interesting. In order to do the thing that was so magical and cool, which is this multi reboot RAID BIOS configuration, out of band, like all this stuff that had to be coordinated, we had to build an orchestration engine. Mm -hmm. um, and people would come up to me all the time in the OpenStack world, like I just want your RAID and BIOS configuration stuff. I'm like, you can't do it without orchestration. It's it's how it works. Right. And, and so and. But what happened is, is that we, we built this orchestration and then we built it also to do uh, OpenStack deployment. And that required us to do this multi-node configuration. And so both this you know, lifecycle management for a node and the orchestration to do uh, you know, a complex cluster deployment with a dependency graph, those two things together um, created a level of complexity that was daunting for people to get started with um, and created a lot of magic. And when, when we got to version three, we said, we have to nail this, you know, node lifecycle flow that you're describing. It's like, I want to push a button and the node comes up 
and I'm when when it's done, it's done, and I never touched it a second time. A lot of people want that. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, there's a question for you in the middle of this because that is what we did with three. It's much simpler. It's it's still complex in a in a way, but you can watch you can watch the um, you can watch the gears turn. Um, so there's a um, one of the Dr. Seuss, uh, not Dr. Seuss, one of the um, Oz books. I love it. If you if you read the other Oz books, not just the Wizard, there's a glass cat, and you can watch its brains work. Um, All right, right. I was thinking that analogy, right? It's like you're watching the brains the brains go. Um, it's a really important thing, but but you get this node orchestration goes all the way to the end, really simple, but we, we, we effectively ripped out the multi-node state engine. Um, right. We spent, you know, man years, uh, person years crafting to make, do all this cool stuff, but it was too complex. And so it's on the shelf. Maybe it'll come back. Maybe it won't. Um, you know, that, I, I was, that was, yeah, I was reading the white paper. <laughs> ah, you just excellent. published, right? And uh, building infrastructures and layers white paper. Right. Yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was like you talk about like um, basically deconstructing V2, right? And provision yeah. is like the first bit of V2. And I remember when you guys launched V3, it was it was like, oh, I this is my words. Okay, we take a step back, let's take the first piece of it. Maybe it wasn't even the first piece because I don't think the BIOS stuff's in there, right? No. But let, let's take the OS installer piece out that does the Pixie and everything and make that a standalone thing and polish that up and launch it out. And like people find that useful, right? Like Cobbler must die, right? It's like <laughs> uh, it's one poor guy maintaining the code base. Mike Don is done, you know, and uh, it's it's still getting the occasional commit, but it's getting along in the tooth, right? And right. Uh, I I don't really can't speak to Foreman. I almost looked at Foreman. I'm looking for something that can do a little bit more than those tools, and that's why Digital Rebar was so appealing. So you know, I think it was great. It's like, look, let's just start here, build this one thing that does this. It's like the Unix concept build a thing that does one thing well and be able to pipe it into other things that do their one thing well, right. which I think hey, is super powerful. Hey, Will, hey, I, me, I love that description. Go ahead, Stephen. I was going to ask a question, Will. You mentioned something about Cobbler. So obviously, you know, we're trying to reach Cobbler users to make them aware of Digital Rebar and, uh, you know, to take a look at it because we think it's a good solution. Do you have any suggestions on reaching those Cobbler users? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I'm looking around trying to reach them. And, um, you know, is, that, is there a subculture of cobbler people still communicating? <laughs> I, or, or is it just a, some uh, servers that we should look under? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, where, where like, is, is there a secret sauce for cobbler users? No, I, I mean, I don't know, like, who uses what. I, I think, I, I don't even know how I got turned on to it. But, I mean, certainly was... It was very popular, and someone somewhere along the way was like, "Oh, if you want a pixie system that does, you can like kind of like have a whole bunch of um, no definitions, you know, and it can do some cool post things with snippets, like, hey, cobbler, you know." And I I never got it does it did the thing I wanted it to do, so I never went as far as investigating Foreman. By the time I heard of Foreman, I was into Ansible. Unfortunately, Ansible, Mike Gahan and the Foreman people had some kind of falling out, I understand. And so there was never going to be any integration with Ansible and Foreman is what I heard. It was more of a puppet tool. And uh, so because I wasn't a puppet guy, I didn't pursue it. But yeah, to answer your question, like I, uh, you know, I'm hang out with hardcore ops people. I go to Lisa conference. I was in this Lopsa thing. Lopsa, I don't know what status it's in anymore, but it's, it's sysadmins for sysadmins, right? Yeah, we so need I to go, go there. I get, you know, DevOps days is much more heady. <laughs> I mean, right. it's, it's totally necessary. I think the field has to change in many ways. And uh, to me, it's more philosophy 
to, to be honest, we talk a lot about tools at DevOps days, but it's, it's really about philosophy. And, and like things like Lisa or like a bunch of guys trying to get their jobs done, like trying to, you know, make metal, make the thinking sand do the thing we wanted to do. And, uh, you know, and, it, and sharing our experience with each other. And, you know, th to me, those are the places where you can talk this nitty gritty, like, hey, who here uses Cobbler? You know, have you taken a look at our tool? Um, you know, certainly Cobbler has no API that I know of. You know, so. you can SSH in and run commands on the local box. Right, right, right. It's like yeah, a switch you know. from that yeah. perspective. <laughs> exactly. And we know, all know where networking uh, OSs are. It's like 20 years ago, like it used to be Telnet. Now it's SSH. And that's about, you know, the extent of the change. And, and you're, you're describing people who have owned their infrastructure, have very clear boundaries of control. And they, you know, they've got it automated and it works. And, and for them, you know, that's, and they, they understand that they're willing to kick, play with kickstarts and precedes and, you know, yeah. they, they've consistent, very consistent heterogeneous or homogeneous infrastructures. Um, and so that's right. And, and Cobbler, you know, has served that market pretty well. Um, it does what it does, you right. know. And the challenge is a lot of people I know have 10 year old unpatched versions of cobbler. It's yeah. Um, you know, it's, you can't secure it. There's, there's all sorts of, of challenges. When we built digital rebar, especially provision, it was designed not as a thing itself. It was designed to be a, a service in a workflow. And that's one of the big, the big challenges except for, and you, you deserve actually a ton, of, a ton of credit for this. And there are specifically features that we could point to as your features. <laughs> uh, per, the way we parameterized templates the first time was actually you coming back and saying, this isn't enough to replace Cobbler yet because I need this feature from Cobbler. And, and we would literally get on Slack. Um, I don't even think we were doing Slack at that time, Gitter. Um, and bounce things off of you and you would say, I need this feature before I can replace Cobbler. I need this feature before I can replace Cobbler. And we just went through a checklist and check, 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 check. Um, there's, a, there's actually a, a funny story in the middle of that, which why we didn't do this three years ago, because uh, Greg Althaus and I, um, I, I, we had a lunch in downtown Austin. I could take, take you if anybody ever wants the history tour, but we were sitting at a effectively a diner in downtown Austin. And I was saying, I, I want to kill Cobbler. I want to kill Cobbler. Can we do that? And he's like, uh, it's, you know, we have, it's hard to make it that simple. Right. Um, Dude, and, Mike, Mike, Mike DeHaan has a gift. I mean, you got to look at it. It's like that guy wrote Cobbler and then he went, wrote Ansible. Mm -hmm. now, now he's taking a well-deserved break doing something. I don't know what. But you know, it's like he, his tools are elegant. You know, he's he's got a good design sense to him. That, you know? th that's right. The, uh, to me, this is the Hashi the HashiCorp team. Yes, right? We've done yes. our Terraform integration, and um, they you know, that is that's where as we aspire to that same. That's you know, you look at people like that, you look at tools like that, and and those become role models. You're right. The Linux model is yeah. It's it's like the Linux tool model is like you know, pick the one thing, make it really simple and, you know, simple enough and, and, and do one thing well and don't try to like boil the ocean. And, and V2 was super cool. I loved it, but it was an ocean boiler, I guess, yeah. at the end of the day. Well, you know. it, we started off with a really simple story. Um, and this is in that white paper too, so I won't dwell on it too much, but to do upgrades. Um, mm -hmm. Right, that was, we, we did version one, we did Crowbar, we got installs for OpenStack as smooth as, as smooth as anybody can do it, right? SUSE still uses that tool seven years later <laughs> to install <laughs> OpenStack. Uh, we got as smooth as you could make it. Um, and then product management turned around and said, but we really want to be able to upgrade. And we're like, that's a different problem. Right. And so all of the version two stuff really came around of, of building this flexible, uh, graph that you could you know make incremental changes to and we did all right. sorts of fun demos that validated it 
Um, and that might be a segue into this, this discussion about immutability because when I'm talking to people now, they're like, I don't do upgrades anymore. Right. I just, I, I just destroy everything. And, and, then, and put the new thing out there, right? Do, do you want to, I would love to have, have you describe that, that thought. I love getting sort of the definition of, of immutability from different people and, and hear it in their words. Can well, you? Yeah, let me think about this. Uh, you know, to, to me, it's like, it's like, it's like a crystal or a running thing. It's like, it, it's, it's not, it, you know, a, an immutable operating system. Like it, it, you know, loads into memory and, and does the things and nothing in it can be changed. Like the state has to live somewhere else. Like the, there's running state, but like any persistent data, it's not going to be in the bounds of that operating system. It's got to be outboard, right? And, and it just runs. It's the brains of the operation. And if you want to replace it, like make a new artifact and do a replace, right? And to me, that's like super interesting, but it's also operationally hard with, with, you know, a certain section. I mean, if it's greenfield and you can get your brain around it, it's awesome, you know, but like, I'm, I live in Brownfield, you know, I mean, we, we, we love to talk about data. So before, so do you think immutability is a good word for this, this concept? Uh, I, you know, I don't know in, is, as far as a operating system goes, okay. You know, um, we actually have a cluster that net boots off a single node and every, it's, everything's uh, NFS mounted. You know, I'm not saying it's awesome model, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, that's kind of like, certain parts are immutable of it. Certain parts, if you change it, boom, it changes across the whole cluster. Mm. Certain parts of it have like local state on the nodes themselves and it's it's frankly it's a mess and i'm working to replace it i mean it's got some cool ideas you know right but in the in a realm of an operating system like i can i get docker immutability you know it's an app container it's like don't try to mess with it if you want a new one produce a new one and replace it right you know and keep it in the state, the persistent state has to live somewhere else, like some central, that works great for that. In the realm of a whole operating system for like a server, I, my head's not around it yet. We, we've, we've played a bit and Greg has some interesting ideas about separating the disk subsystem from the operating system like you can immutably boot an operating system and configure it and install the app in it but the data would be mounted on disk and then you'd attach the disks and attach the data and, and then you you know so it's you get a little bit of both um but that that means that you're not the servers aren't cattle from that perspective uh going back to that analogy they're not disposable so you you have to you're basically able to reset the operating system on a regular basis, right? Make sure that nobody's penetrated it, that the keys are right, that the configuration mm -hmm. is, and then the data doesn't get dragged, you know, the data, you're basically uh, back to a, a data pinned to a server, pin, pinned to disks, if you want to think about it that way. Right. Um, we've, okay. and we've actually, I think I did a blog post two years ago about the, these different state, you know, with Greg, like Greg and I had talked about this and I documented the different layers, very early days of immutability. Um, mm -hmm. It, it is interesting. So the OS is memory resident. That's, that's yeah. one of the simplest ways to do it. Um, super fast from a boot recycle perspective. Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's, it, it's interesting. And I suppose if you need different binaries or something, you're deploying another image to it. Right. There's no apt get in that world. Uh, you want to avoid it. And it's, so what the, I would the say you have I, to avoid it. You have, <laughs> and that's it's. But but those are. I mean, those installs are super slow. And people, what I see people doing is do, between Docker 
and VM deployments where they're using Packer to build a VM and deploy the mm -hmm. VM. Yep. Um, those things are really powerful concepts. They're just now filtering back into physical where people are saying, oh, I, I just Packered my image. Can I just deploy that? Because they know that if you turn around and then do an app get, even if it's local, you know, in your in your network, it's still going to take forever to go through the app get install, and it's going to build. It's like Ruby gems, and what yeah, you, I, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's like if you know exactly what the thing you're going to build. See, I work in research. No one knows what they're doing mm -hmm. in the till maybe in the middle of doing it, you know. Yeah. And and you it, things have to be mutable in that world, like you're not producing this like like we're gonna get it right, or you know, we're gonna try to get it right, and we're gonna produce this artifact, we're gonna deploy it, and that's the way it's going to be. And hey man, no one can change it, it no one can penetrate it. And, and if we, then, if when we find out from the customer, like what's wrong with it or whatever, we'll incorporate that into a new artifact and deploy. I, you know, that sounds like a great thing. There's other use cases where it's like they need that malleable playground you know to to try things like i don't know how well it would work in my world right so is, is there a compromise in this that that sort of says we don't patch we reset but we we don't we don't try to create an image that is that is pre-staged so this is right there's there's two levels in this right there's like look I'm never going to take a machine and then rerun Papa Chef or Ansible on it. I'm going to run, it's going to be run once and done. And if you don't like it, there's a reset button and you, you tune it and you reset. Right, 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 right. So this is what I'm trying to do with the research community I work with. It's okay. like, let me control all the software load. Let's put it this way. The, the, the system software because mm. like we can use environment variables and stuff, uh, environment modules rather, to do user software. Like you want custom C++ this, like use environment modules, like load your own binaries. You're, they're just for you. They're not right. gonna step on the system ones um, and you can have your own, it's like a Python virtual app. Um, but, so like, let me control the system load. If you need more stuff, I, I'll, I'll build it up as you, you know, ask me for things. And sometimes I'll fork off like, okay, there's this type of node and that type of node. Um, and let me control that. You, you guys, the users will never apt get, you don't get sudo. Like I want to control it. And mm. I try to do it as a redeploy. It's like, well, it's quick enough. Let me just re-roll the node, you know, and make sure everything's, but you know, with Ansible, I do it with Ansible. You can, it'll just conform it to the new state. Oftentimes that's good enough too. It's like, everything's green, 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 green. Oh, I have to modify that. That's fine. It, you know, put new software in. It's not worth re-rolling a node for that. Right. That's quick enough. That's what, so the, the, this is where I think, you know, every, every install is a little bit different. What people need to do is a little bit different. Um, like I could see building an image where you've, you know, an Ansible run, the first half of it is, you know, baked into the image and you basically get to a point you're like, it's, it's going to run those really quickly. Cause even Ansible, it can be pretty slow. <laughs> yes. I have um, I've known Ansible to be slow. Yes. Right. And so, the, you know, the idea that I could say, all right, I, I'm mostly done. This is like, um, this was public. So like we were talking, we were at DevOps days talking to some Capital One people and they have uh, a baked image that has a whole bunch of stuff in it and they roll it every couple of months. Actually, it's like six week. The, there's a new image comes out. Everybody has to migrate it to it. And that has, a, you know, a whole bunch of stuff pre-staged in it. And so they, you know, they sort of continually enhance and drop things from that image um, for this exact reason. And then, then their post configuration is, you know, what you're describing, the snowflake pieces. Mm -hmm. And they roll, it's an AMI and they can roll it out, you know, globally and things are pretty, pretty, there's just, I'm, I was impressed by that sort of hybrid um, immutability, hybrid immutability. 
thing. Can that be a thing? I think people don't, are their heads are going to explode. You just buzzworded yeah. two things together. Don't think that. <laughs> uh. it's stew, man. Uh, so, so like when you say immutability, though, Rob, is it like the, truly immutable? I mean, they the, the, uh, those bits can they be changed or not? Right. So. I, uh, this is the, I, I struggle with this. Or I struggle with the word about an initial image. I mean, so, so when I, when I think about immutability for this, you always do post configuration immutability. There's no true immutability, even in, in cloud images, right? You're injecting configuration or identity mm -hmm. or keys or you're always doing something. And so to me, it's sort of like immutability is two minutes past config past provisioning you don't make any more changes. <laughs> oh, okay, right. oh uh, I see. Right. Like, right. It's, there's a little so post to fit for use. And then the goal is don't touch it. Just use right. it. Right. Right. That's it. It has, right. So, you, you know, and people can get much further to the left on this in that they would be, you know, Oh, it's that, that image starts from an image I created out of my CI environment, which I think is great. Yeah. But they're still doing post configuration on it. It's never this, you know, never, you know, not untouched thing. You have to, you know, give that machine identity and uniqueness and, you know, instantiate. Right. Yeah. I, I, and I want to do that through a tool like yours is like, Hey, that state's kept in the, the, the tool that makes the image and, um, you know, like we're, we're giving it the host name, we're giving it the IP, we're giving it the default gateway. We're telling which disks to use. I mean, I have a different world, so I'm, I'm not like, I definitely am not the norm. Like my, I'm like, so uh, hetero, it's ridiculous. You know, everyone wants something different. Like I, I, I get like little chunks of the same, but most things are different all the time. Right. You know, they're always buying stuff. There's always stuff to be redeployed. It's, it's crazy. And, and that, makes, that makes you, in my mind, the ideal you know, digital rebar user. Um, we see this quite a bit, but that's, that's what we build for. It would be so much easier for us to have built a Dell-only tool that only works on 720s with you know, uh, Power Connect switches. And, right. You know, and, and that's not, we don't see that in the field. We, what we see in the field is closer to you where somebody bought a bank of super micros cause they were on sale for a, right. For, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so and how many generations of super micros? <laughs> it, well, it only yeah. takes two shipments to have three generations. So, uh, I tell you, um, so many. So, so Will and Rob, I'm going to jump in cause we're getting to be a long podcast. So this is amazing conversation. So Will, I, I'm going to kind of ask you one more question so we can kind of wrap this up. We really appreciate you coming on. I think this is amazing because there's so many people trying to understand digital rebar. We want people to really get a good feel for it. And you're really providing a viewpoint that um, it's hard to get and, and we appreciate you being here. So sure. my last question really is, you know, what's your wish list? I mean, let's say that, you know, you told Rob, these are three things I want. Rob had no choice but to do it. Um, what would those th maybe three things or something shorter be? And then from there, you know, we'll go ahead and wrap out. Okay. So let me think, <laughs> let me prioritize this in my head. What, what I guess I really wanted, and I, I've said this before, is I want the tool to inventory my metal to be able to deploy the operating system and and like image based is that would be very interesting if i could blow a an image on there's all kinds of problems with that we're trying to do that it has mainly to do with uh the image doesn't match the target disk but anyways um hard problems yep. yeah exactly uh and I would like for the DRP system to hand off to the orchestration tool to somehow drive the kickoff of the orchestration tool. I don't know if that's on the roadmap. I, I'm reading this, the white papers, the, the coupled orchestration. Um, yeah. And, and it, it was a design decision that like, hey, we're going to go this far. And then the orchestration tool, you can use whatever you want. We'll integrate with a lot of things. but 
you know, you have to go somewhere else and kick off the Ansible or the Puppet or Salt. I would love it if DRP somehow could like drive that to make it more of a one pass thing. But I don't know if that makes sense. For, you. for sing for single node, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for, I'm yes, right. To, for multi to do, for multi node, that's that's less likely. Yeah, but, and I understand that. Yeah. I, I am talking, I guess, about single node, right? Then yes, <laughs> what what you're asking for is really a runner extension or you know, runner behavior. Right. So and, I like that. That's great. Yeah, and it, it would produce a one pass. So I'm I'm. My whole thing with doing the, the whole Pixie environment is lay the base operating system down and do just enough configuration in that post to, to make it so your tool runs, your orchestration tool runs. Mine's Ansible. So right. I'm, gonna, I'm going to like put my key on it. I'm going to like ensure Python 2 exists on Ubuntu 16 because, you know, they don't ship it with Python 2 anymore and Ansible needs it. And, and then I want to like, and now run this playbook on this node. That would be awesome if, if the DRP tool could do that. So I think that's my number one thing. Okay. Number two is uh, some kind of RBAC because mm -hmm. I'd love to make, I know. <laughs> so yeah, that's a reasonable to create. Yeah. No, I, I want it to be self-service. I want different people to be able to operate on their nodes. I, I think the the solution to that is give everyone their own DRP system, but I still <laughs> there might need to be, well, no, you're talking about this edge computing, like <laughs> it's very small. It's yeah. just embedded like hither and yon. There doesn't have to be one central one. It could be many of them. And we, we have that cool UI that you pick your endpoint. That's cool. I there, still need some there, kind of role control. There, there is, there is a roadmap item for Rackend to produce a self-service portal um, that provides that function. I, I will tell you, there's a, there's a way to do this um, because it's on our roadmap to do it. Um, the, the free tip here is that you could do it uh, by examining the token systems, and you could give users uh, limited access tokens to blocks of machines. Um, Crafting the token is, is would require some expertise, which is why there's a, a rack and product right. um, outside of the open source piece that, that people will pay money to avoid crafting those tokens by hand. Um, but it's right. it's it's enabled in the open source capability and security model to do what you're asking. Um, and you could also do it by multiple having multiple ERPs. We've we've considered that option too. Right. And and I'll, what I'm I guess I'm talking about is limiting access to maybe different functions within mm -hmm. the endpoint, right? Tokens can do it. Yeah, Token, okay, cool. generate tokens to do it. All right. Totally. And and the third thing, are you ready for this? Uh oh no. <laughs> Great, go for it. Documentation. Oh uh, yeah, that's true. All right. So the best open source products are have like awesome docs. Yeah. Kubernetes, right? It's like, it like if you, you have something that's complex enough, you must have docs. If it's super simple, you probably don't need so many docs. But like your tool is to the point now, I tripped for like 24 hours trying to, I'm, I wrote a pull request. And I thought, you know what, before I just submit this, I want to test it. I tripped over, I did not know something about the DRP tool and mm -hmm. there's nothing in the docs about it that the way I was doing it could never work. And Greg ah. enlightened me on Slack. Oh yeah, yeah, you can't do it that way. I'm like, ugh, dude, you know? And I know it, it's a small team and there's only so many hours a day and we all have families and that's right. all super legit. But it's like, please. Oh, I, I, you are entirely right. I completely, uh, we, we were very careful to do 3x 30 documentation and get the stage you know the the pre orchestration stuff we doc there's a lot of documentation there's a lot of support right the api is all self documenting but i you were right um, and it's something we're we're going to have to fix and Shane's, Shane Shane uh, is new hire for us he's helping tremendously and we're building some training 
yep, all sorts of materials will be available. But the stage runner um, jobs, all that part of the infrastructure, um, if, especially if you're just looking at it as a cobbler replacement, um, yeah, that's, 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 that's much more complex. It's, it's right. That's, that's as close to orchestration as you can get without being orchestration. Right. Um, and it's super powerful. Once I learned how to use it, I was like, Oh my God, this is awesome. Yeah. You know, but I had to, I had to like stumble my way into it actually, you know, and that's, and I don't want to brag on you. I know, no, it's, it's, it's a totally fair. It's one of those things where I, we have this debate all the time, right? And uh, with back buttons and, and I know, uh, Stephen, you're going to give me the stink eye because we're going, we're going long. Yeah, uh, so I, I won't, I won't wax on onto, you know, uh, you know, buttons that, that should work in the UX one way, but don't, and we should fix them, but I'm busy building content previews because it's a, you know, more power, it's, you know, a prioritized feature set. Um, we would, you know, people <laughs> show up, come in, help. We love, we, you know, it's an open source thing. So we're right. So I think, I think one of the things, Will, first of all, thank you for being honest and oh, yes, really thank you. hammering Rob. And I love it. I think it's great. <laughs> I love that. And, um, uh, but, to Rob. but, you know, to me, you know, Rob and myself and, you know, I mean, I've been doing open source a long time. This is the way it should be. And, you know, it's a small project. It, it's, it doesn't have a lot of exposure. And so, you know, one of the things, these kind of podcasts and stuff, you know, someone are listening to this and go, you know what, you know, I like to write. I like to make documentation. I know most of us think those people don't exist, but I know they do. And mm -hmm. so, you know, if you're, if you're that kind of person, we'd love to hear from you and expand the project. And uh, who knows, maybe one day uh, Rob will make me try some documentation. Not sure about it, but even I may take a look. But uh, it, it, it would be beautifully written if, if you did. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, well, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, for our, our listeners, uh, I know we've gone over, but I think this was a really fascinating conversation. For me, you know, a chance to talk to, you know, bring in Will. We spoke the other day and I was like, Rob, you know, we got to get him on a podcast right away. I love hearing the perspective from someone who's using the project and you get a whole different feel for it. And I know that one of the things that Rob and his team do a good job with is listening. And yeah. so, um, you know, you've been talking to these guys and following this for, is this six or seven years, Rob? This project's been going on? All in, at least, yeah. At least, I mean, I remember being at Rackspace writing a whole community plan for running this project before I came to Dell. So I know it's been a long time. And, uh, you know, well, thanks again for joining us. For our listeners, I hope you found this useful. And uh, if you know someone who is an admin or operator or thinking DevOps, pass this along. We, you know, the more people become aware of this project, the more people we can bring in the more features we can build, the faster it can go, you know, all those kind of open source goodness. And uh, Will and Rob, thanks again for uh, chatting with us this evening. And I look forward to maybe in about six months or so, Will, we'll bring you on again and you can kind of give us where you are, where the project is. I think you're a, a great person to give us a snapshot in time and uh, we'll continue leveraging you. Thanks to both of you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen.